uh, thanks, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, we've had a we've had a terrific day. Now, it's, and I want to be not so echoey. Um, we've had a terrific day, and um, uh, you know, I I'm so glad you guys are here. I, I I wish there's so so many interesting things have been said today. I wish there was more people here to to absorb it and process it because I know I'm going to have things that I have to think about for quite a long time after this. Um, but uh, what I'm going to do now is introduce our our final keynote speaker of the day, and that'll be uh, Bill Smart from OSU. Uh, Bill Smart is a very talented and uh, accomplished roboticist. He, he's made all sorts of robotic systems do all sorts of things. He was also a pioneer in the, the, the problem of getting people and robots to interact together to do things. Uh, one of his early projects was actually a wedding photography robot that would uh, go around at a wedding and take pictures of people. And, and getting that dynamic right brings up all kinds of really fascinating, interesting problems. Uh, one of the reasons that we asked him to come today to talk is he's also been involved in creating a conference that is at, the, at an interface that I wouldn't have thought existed, but basically robotics and law. But now this is actually a very relevant topic, and um, I think they were ahead of the curve trying to think about what these different issues might be and how they could impact us, and that's going to be the main thing he talks about today. Um, I would also like to mention, though, that he was a, a graduate student here at Brown. Uh, and in fact, he was, he's an academic sibling of mine. We shared the same advisor. We were here at the same time. And he was doing cool robot stuff then, too. Um, and so, uh, so it just, it's really a treat to have Bill back here speaking and sharing his insights with us. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Mike. Uh, the last time I was in the conference room across the street, I was defending my thesis 13 years ago. Um, and I'm considerably more nervous about this talk than I was about that talk. Um, we, as Michael said, I've, I've been involved a little bit in helping to set up a, a conference called We Robot. I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, it's a conference that spans uh, policy, law, and robotics. And it it, at the time, it seemed like this very novel thing. Like three, four years ago, it started that. Um, and we have some of the other suspects, uh, Peter and Kate over there, who are regulars at WeRobot. Um, it's kind of like this. It's kind of this broad community. And I'm, I'm really delighted to see economists in the audience and people who are not AI geeks who have clustered in the front row here. You are, yeah, but who, who are not you. Because um, I think. Um, as we've been talking today, there's the, the question of where robots are going to go, where AI is going to go, is there going to be a singularity? Um, we've all been thinking about this in our independent fields. And I think the thing that gives me hope for the future of this uh, that doesn't lead me down all these dystopian futures is that we're actually all in the same room talking about this stuff right now before it happens. And we're talking about the economic impacts and the legal impacts and the social impacts. Um, so what I want to do with this, this talk is just talk a little bit about um, how robots and the law interact and share some stories from the We Robot conference. Just let you guys know what they're, they're thinking about, what part of the space they're interested in. Um, do we have any lawyers in the audience? Any lawyers. lawyers, anyone with legal training? Sweet. So then you're not going to be able to call me out when I get it wrong. I'll get it mostly right, but I'm not a lawyer. Um, so the robots are all coming, and there's nothing we can do to stop them. We're starting to see robots out. Uh, we have robots in our homes. We have robots in the skies in the forms of drones, autonomous, um, autonomous gliders in the oceans, robots in factories. We can't stop them. They're coming. We're going to have to deal with them. And so we, we, we kind of need to get ready for them. And I, my sense is that today has been getting ready for them, thinking about the futures. Um, I like the, the, the panel where we're talking about the distal and proximal futures, right? We've got to think about all of the, we can't wait till it happens. We've got to start thinking about it now, even for the stuff that's 100 years down the line. Um, and so we've heard some economic arguments today. We've heard some arguments from different fields. But what I want to do is talk about some of the legal implications. Um, and we need to get ready to think about the legal implications, partly because there's a real chance of getting it wrong. And if we get the legislation around robotics wrong, it'll kill the industry dead. And so um, that's kind of the, the overarching thing for the talk. Um, I am not a lawyer. Um, I work with lawyers and I talk to lawyers. And so I may get it wrong 
we have at least one sort of lawyer in the audience. I'm pointing at you. Yeah. Well, that, that's that sort of That's what a sort of lawyer is. Um, I'm a sort of computer scientist now. Um, so, yell if I get anything really badly wrong. Um, what I wanted to, to talk about is at a fairly high level how the law and robots interact and some of the issues that we have to think about as technologists, as people interested in robots. Um, can I get a show of hands? Of, how many people would call themselves technologists here? Economists, um, social science, policy, any other, anything else, other things? Okay. Retirees. Retirees. <laughs> Dilettantes. Um, okay. So hopefully this will be nice and, nice and broad. Um, so talks are going to break down into four parts. Um, the first is I'm going to talk a little bit about how lawyers think, because they don't think like you and me. Um, there's a particular way that legislation is formed and that uh, lawyers think. And it's really informat informative to understand that because it tells us how we should talk about robots. And what I'm going to claim is that the way we talk about robots, especially to people who are not technologists, is going to really frame how the laws around those robots are, are formed. And it's really going to affect it. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the stuff we've seen at We Robot, the robots are here part, and then a couple of suggestions um, for trying to head off the apocalypse. So the law. Um, this is Supreme Court, the current Supreme Court of the United States. So how lawyers think. The, the basic way that lawyers think, the basic way that laws are formed is that you have a situation that you want to legislate, you find a previous situ situation that was kind of the same, and you make an analogy. So suppose you want to legislate this new invention, the horseless carriage. Well, what does it do? Well, it carries people over ground. OK, so we have laws around horses, what you're allowed to do on the road with a horse. So a reasonable way to proceed might be to say, all right, we're going to take all the, the laws that apply to horses, and we're going to migrate them to cars. So if you, drove, if you rode your horse on the right hand, I always have to think, right hand, left hand, right hand side of, right hand side of the road, right hand side of the road, then you should drive your car on the right hand side of the road. Okay, that makes sense. So there's an analogy, there's a metaphor that we're using, transportation device. That metaphor gives us an analogy. Okay, what else is a transportation device? Horses are transportation devices. All right, so we understand horses. That's kind of like that, OK? So we can form new laws, um, hopefully general laws, that encompass both of those systems, perhaps spe uh, with special tweaks for the car. Um, seem good? Sensible? What are those then you get into f picking your analogy. And that's going to be the tricky bit. So there's more than one thing you can analogize this to. It could be a horse and a cart. It's going to be a little bit different. It could be a donkey, which is probably going to be similar. Um, but picking the, so getting the analogy right is, cru is crucial. So there could be more than one analogy you could make. We'll get to that in a sec. Um, implicit in this are some assumptions. Okay. So to make the analogy work, these things have to be equivalent at some level. So this worked. This would work with this car. A galloping horse is not as equivalent to a Bugatti as a walking horse is to this car. So implicit in this analogy is that they kind of go at the same speed, maybe. Now, the problem is that for a long time, whoops, 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 whoops. for a long time, this analogy would have worked, because cars couldn't go that fast. And then, all of a sudden, we have cars that go faster, and it reveals our assumptions are broken. We've made an implicit assumption, and it hasn't kept up with the technology. And because of that, the laws might not work. So the metaphor we use really matters. Um, so imagine you had a computer on which you could play music. 
and that music came from somewhere on the internet. Your expectations of what you can do with that music are informed by how you describe it. So if I say, oh, Michael, I've got this great music library on my computer. What does that, what, what would you expect? What could I do with that music? Yeah, so it, it, there's a loaning thing, right? Um, it's a library. What happens in libraries? You borrow things and you give them back. You don't play, so you're not allowed to play it loudly, right? Uh, you, you give it, you, you borrow it and you give it back. Okay? Now, if I had said, oh, Michael, Michael, I've got access to a record store on my computer, the implication is that I buy it and it's mine. Okay? Now, if you analogize your streaming service this way, and then, well, if you analogize it this way, it's a record store, and then try to take the music back from me because you want to de-license it to me, it's going to be harder to convince uh, the legal community, I claim, than if you had anal analogized it like this. Okay, so at the technological level, it's the same thing and you get the same end product, you get music coming out of your speakers, but depending on how you frame it, you're going to get different responses from the legal community. All right. So Michael introduced me as a roboticist. I'm actually a professional email answerer who does robotics in his spare time. Um, so suppose you had this new technology. You had this way of sending text over the internet to people to give them messages. You didn't have to write it on paper anymore. You could, you could do this electronic thing. And you want to, f um, I grabbed this. This is not my inbox. <laughs> um, I, I actually checked to see what it said. I hope it's not appropriate. Um, you want to form some legislation around that. Okay, and this doesn't, this, this example is not gonna mirror the legislation that's actually been formed around it. So, how do you analogize some method of sending messages over the internet, right? What's, what the, what's the thing that already exists that you can make liken this to so you can be informed? Clearly, it's a series of tubes, pneumatic tubes in this case. <laughs> One person laughed. I spent <laughs> 10 minutes on that last night. Um, here's an analogy. It's a letter. It's a letter sent electronically. Okay, so it's not a physical paper letter, but it's a letter. And that's probably a pretty good analogy because this letter has an address. It's got a return address. Okay, that's both the same as this electronic message transfer thing. It's got a protocol. Okay, um, if you want to get down into the weeds, it's got a wrapper, a protocol wrapper. The envelope wraps up the message. So it, it's a pretty good analogy. And so you go to the, the, the legislature and say, I have this new thing. It's an electronic version of a letter. And they go, sweet. So now I have a frame to think about this new technology. It's a letter. We have laws for letters. Another analogy you could use is a postcard. And it works just as well. Okay? Um, on the back of this postcard, there will be an address. There will be information. There will be a stamp. Um, it has a rather attractive picture on the front. Um, but it's, it's essentially the same thing, right? You could choose to analogize it as a postcard rather than a letter. So why is that different? You can read the back of the postcard. Right. So now you've deployed this, and it's five years in, and someone's reading your email. And you go to the court and say, someone's reading my email. And they say, oh, well, it's analogized as a letter. Letters are sealed, and it's a federal crime to open a letter. There's an expectation of privacy. You can't read someone's email. On the other hand, if you had analogized it as a postcard, whoop, whoop, here, there's no real expectation that people won't read your postcards, because all you have to do is flip it over. It turns out, so I tried to figure out if reading the back of a postcard that wasn't addressed to you is illegal. And I'm not sure if it is or not. I think it is from what I can read on the internet. Um, the very fact that we don't know if that's illegal or not, that's a problem when you come to analogize this as a privacy thing. Um, 
I would not expect this to be private. I would not put any details on this. And in fact, there's, there are cases on the internet where court summons have been issued on postcards, and that's been raised as a problem because people can <coughs> see that you're getting summoned. So the analogy really, really, really matters. Um, there's often implicit assumptions, and they're, they're based on the technology. So around about 1920, uh, there was a gangster, Roy Olmsted, who got wiretapped by the feds. Anyone who's nodding is a proto-liar, if you know. Um, and the, te the telephone was quite a new technology back then. Wiretapping was a very new technology. And so what happened is they wiretapped him, and they got evidence against him, convicted him of a crime. Um, and he, what he said was that was a violation of his Fourth and Fifth Amendment privileges. The Fourth Amendment, you're not allowed to search and seize. And the Fifth Amendment, you can't, you're not required, you're not compelled to in, uh, incriminate yourself. And so it went to the Supreme Court uh, around about 1920. And the Fourth Amendment, so there was no warrant for this wiretap. The feds just climbed the pole, listened in. And the federal court, uh, the, the Supreme Court, ruled that it was not an invasion of his privacy to wiretap him. And the feds were completely within their right to do so without a warrant which seems strange, right? The reason is kind of subtle. So Justice Taft wrote this. The amendment, uh, oh, here, here. Uh, the amendment does not forbid what was done here. There's, there was no searching. There was no seizure. The evidence was secured by the sense of hearing, and that only. There was no entry of the houses or offices of the defendants. The notion of the Fourth Amendment up until this case, and actually until 1967, was intimately tied to trespass, to going to my window and listening, because that was the only way you could hear someone. And so the understanding of the Fourth Amendment was tied to the understanding of being on my property in my physical space. And what happened with wiretapping is we got to the point where you no longer had to be physically present to listen to what I was saying. A strict interpretation of the Fourth Amendment says that if you're not trespassing, or that strict interpretation, said if you're not on my property, you can't be violating my privacy. Because there's this implicit bias. Um, so this is a real problem. Technology, as, as technology advances, it takes these assumptions we have about the legal structures we have in the, the laws, and it violates them. And we're going to see this a lot with robots. Um, actually, in fact, even the word eavesdropping, the, the, the origin of the word eavesdropping is hiding under the eaves of someone's house listening at their window. So the analogies matter and the assumptions underlying the, the analogies matter. And so what I'm going to claim is that this is especially true for robots. And the robots are going to break our analogies and break our understandings faster than other technology. This is, this is an in-joke for the wee robot crowd. Um, so robots chatter your assumptions. So not only now can we communicate with people at a distance over the telephone, we can log into a robot. We can be in some place. I can be in Oregon. I can log in to a robot in Providence and raid Michael's liquor cabinet. Okay, So not only can I do communication at a distance, I can now do physical action at a distance. And that's really weird, because up until now, to be able to do something, to be able to steal your stuff, physically steal your stuff, I had to be next to your stuff. Now, I don't have to be next to it, just my robot proxy <coughs> has to be next to it. Um, and I think, I think there's a real risk here. Um, if I were to go and steal something nice from here, this box, I don't know what's in this box. If I were going to steal this box, and I went to the court, my, you, know, you saw me, I skulk off. 
And I go to court and I said, oh, um, I didn't intend for my hand to grab the box and put it in my pocket. That's a pretty weak argument. Okay? There are some conditions, some mental conditions, where that would actually be an argument, but not for normally functioning people. If I went and controlled the robot remotely and said, oh, I didn't intend for the robot to take the box and put it in its backpack, it's not a great argument, but it's a better argument. Right? And I'm betting a lawyer could make some grounds there, and it, it introduces a diffusion of the responsibility, because the robot is not entirely under my control. Right? We've been talking about robots getting more and more intelligent, more and more autonomous, more and more free will. Um, I could maybe argue to uh, a jury of my peers, maybe not a jury of roboticist peers, but a jury of my social peers, that, oh, the robot did it. And they might, they might not believe it, but they might not disbelieve it either. Um, it, it brings up really interesting questions. Uh, so this is the Da Vinci robot, uh, very popular surgery platform. So um, the surgeon sits here, controls the robot's appendages, and there's a patient under there. It used to be to do surgery, you had to be standing next to the patient. Now, this distance can, in theory, be as far as you like. We've demonstrated da Vinci surgeries across oceans, and that's a great thing. But it raises questions which I think the law hasn't had a lot of time to think about. So this is in California. This is in Rhode Island. Where does the surgeon have to be licensed? The surgeons in Rhode Island, the surgery is happening, where's the surgery happening? Is it happening in California or is it distributed? If you, if you say that the surgeon has to happen, has to be licensed in the place that the surgery happens, could you make the argument that every state that the data packet from here travels through to here, you have to be licensed in all of those? Because the surgery is happening in each of those, like something's going on in each of those states. So there's this real risk of going beyond what the law knows. And if we pick the wrong analogies for this, it's going to go, it's going to go terribly. Um, so if we start talking about situations like this, robots, advanced robots like this, uh, using bad metaphors, describing them inappropriately, using metaphors that don't really apply. Um, the robot wants to go over there. The robot actually doesn't want to go over there. It is programmed to go over there. What that's going to do is it's going to lead us to bad analogies. Those bad analogies are going to increase the likelihood we're going to form bad laws, and the bad laws will harm robotics. It'll slow down the industry. There'll be more litigation, and it, it's just going to be bad for the industry, I claim. So we have to be careful what we talk about and how we talk about these systems. Um, we have to, when we're, as technologists, I, I speak as a technologist, when I'm talking to people who are not technologists, who don't understand the algorithms and the underlying mechanisms in the robot, you have to be really clear that, that, it's, that there is no free will there, there is no anima. Um, and we have to do that consistently. So it, it's really, oh. do you feel empathy for the poor robot? <laughs> it's just a mechanism. All right, I'm, I'm, a, it's, I'm a strong AI guy. It's a mechanism. It's code. It's bits. But we feel emp empathy for it. Why? Because we are wired. Because hmm? we're just mechanisms. <laughs> It's mechanisms all the way down. Uh, um, you just derailed me. Um, our mechanism, right, we're deep in the back of your brain. You are wired to be sympathetic to big round eyes looking up at you like that. Okay? That's, that's been wired into us since we were running away from tigers on the plains. Okay? We anthropomorphize everything in our life. We name our cars, we find faces in clouds. We do all this stuff to inanimate objects and we give it um, anima. We, we project stuff onto it. And my claim is, 
We do it even more with robots because robots kind of look human-like, right? Wally's designed to look human-like and to evoke a, an emotional response. But a lot of robots have two cameras because stereo vision is really useful. We tend to arrange the cameras to look like eyes because it looks less creepy. Uh, but we, oh, poor robot. Um, it's, really, it's really seductive to um, anthropo anthropomorphize these robots. Um, it's really seductive to anthropomorphize more than just the robots. So that needs to work. Excellent. Oops. Can you see that? Yeah. This is a video. This is a, a video by two researchers called Hyder and Simmel. Um, basically, I want you to watch this for a little while. From 1944. So what's going on? Can you describe that to me? Which one's, which one's the him? The, the, the clown. Yeah, the, the one inside the clown. Oh, the, the circles of praise and being tied in the bar. Yeah. <coughs> what did intervene in the fight? There we go. So there was a fight, right? There's a context. Attack, right? So the circles are the, the boys. Uh, the, the triangles are the boys. Any more? No, it's just three shapes. They don't want anything. They're not human. They're not male or female. There's no context here. It's just shapes moving around. But we're so, so, so wired to anthropomorphize stuff. We, we build stories around it. Yeah, the triangle ones are probably the boys. They're the aggressive ones, right? Or they're the big kids, and the, 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 the round guy's the little kid. Um, I hate it when YouTube does that. All right. um, we build up these stories because we really want to believe that is what is going on. There we go, good. Because we, we, we use that to explain the world to ourselves. Because if we say it's a fight, that predicts what's going to happen next. And we really like prediction. We really like knowing what's going to happen next, because that stopped us from getting eaten millions of years ago, well, tens of thousands of years. All right? So we do that with shapes. And we do it with things that move. And my claim is, we, we, we're going to do it really hard with robots. We're going to do it extra specially more awesomely with robots. Because robots are the only things that we're going to encounter in our daily lives that move apparently under their own volition that are not humans. We're going to want to ascribe humanity, the anima to them. Um, so I try really, really hard not to do this when I'm talking to people. And I fail. <sighs> the law doesn't think. The law is not a person. Right, we, we do this all the time with abstract concepts. I've anthropomorphized the law into some crusty old human wearing black robes who thinks about something. No, the law is an abstract set of rules. Um, so we do this all the time. We do it to explain things to people who don't know the underlying technology, to give them a sense of what's going on. But it's really, it's really hard. It's really hard and it's really dangerous. Um, robots are the only things that we're going to see in our lives that look alive that aren't alive. That's a sweeping statement. It's probably not true, but it's, it's, it's not wrong. So it's really seductive to look at robots and say, oh, it, it's alive, it's got anima. We might not say that out loud, but we treat them as if they're alive. Robot bangs into the table, people will say, oh, poor robot, right? Um, and that influences the way we think about them, and it influences what we're going to do with them. So we have models in law for things that are not alive, hammers. There is a whole body of law that applies to hammers. The stealing of hammers, the hitting of people with hammers, a whole bunch of law. And there's a whole bunch of law dealing with people, the hitting of people and the stealing of people, and the tricking of people. Um, but what is weird about robots is 
they're neither hammers, because they're, they're not just simple tools. There's no clear, explainable mapping from the input to the output. With a hammer, it does what I tell it every time. So it's not a hammer, but it's also not a human, because humans have agency. Um, in a legal sense, they have intent. So the law is tied up with intent. If you don't intend to commit a crime, it is a lesser thing than if you actually intend to do it. Manslaughter versus murder. Um, so robots kind of fall in the middle, in this, in this spooky ground in the middle. One word to describe that robot. Robot. <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> you. You may leave now. One word to describe that robot. Creepy. <laughs> All right, creep, that's the uh, I was going to say scared. I'm scared, right? It's not scared. It's a robot. It has no emotion. See, we, we layer it on. Um, all right. So, if the, 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 give me give me two slides and I'll answer that. Um, it, because it's neither. There's no clear analogy to either of those for a robot. Is the answer. And I, I, I probably don't mean the kind of robots that you deal with. I'm thinking more of, sort of the cognitive robots with more, you know, more the AI side of things. Um, if I don't answer this within about three, three slides, let me know. Um, so we, we explain this. If someone comes into your lab, if you're like me, your robots never work. They always bang into things. And so, oh, well, the robot saw the table, didn't want to hit it, but it wasn't able to avoid it. That is overloaded. The robot didn't see the table in the sense that we see the table. The robot had photons come into its cameras, get translated to electrical signals, which went through a bunch of circuitry, got translated into some other electrical signals, and the wheels turned, and physics made the, the robot move. So by describing this to people, and I do, I'm, I'm as guilty as the next person, um, you, you begin to frame the robot as having free will, agency, anima. And that means when you, you talk about it in the future, you're more likely to frame it in that way. And you're going to be more likely to apply legal structures from here than legal structures from here. Um, I don't know. Then, yeah, that's the question, right? Um, I'll talk about that in a little bit. We had a discussion about this at We Robot just a little while ago. Um, let me talk about it a little bit. All right. Teleoperating a robot, you crush someone. It happens all the time. That's a very different defense than this. If the robot is not just a hammer, if it's not just a direct tool, what you're doing is you're kind of saying, oh, I, you know, I, I tried to get him out of the way, but the robot made its own decision. And it may have executed some logic that was without, outside your control, but what that does is it kind of introduces the robot as an actor in the legal sense, where there's a you can diffuse your responsibility into the robot. So you're not as culpable as you would have been if it had been just a hammer or something that was directly in your control. Um, so they're alive. Uh, they seem to have agency. Um, and we're, like I said, we're really, key, as humans, we're really key to that. We're really, we, we are very sensitive to things which seem to have free will, and we key on that. We, we ascribe things to them. Um, and the framing really influences us. This is a, an experiment that was recently done at MIT by Dr. Kate Darling and her collaborators. And it's the most glorious experiment I've heard of this year. Um, so these are hex bugs. These are little, they're about an inch long. Uh, it's a little toy for kids. There's a, a vibrating element in here, a little battery, and little rubberized legs. And the legs are curved. And it vibrates. And so when the vibration's lifted up, the legs kind of spring forward a tiny bit. It goes down, and then the elast elasticity in the legs pulls it forward. So it kind of shuffles along the tabletop. If you have kids and you, if you have kids and you don't have these, 
order them on Amazon immediately. They're fantastic. Um, and so Kate has this great experiment where you look at how you describe this robot and can you affect people's <coughs> moral judgments about the robot. Moral judgments? Their behavior, let's say their behavior, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're going to give you one of these robots and we're gonna ask you to smash it with a hammer. Okay. There's gonna be at least two conditions. The two conditions I want to talk about are, the first is you say, well, here is this little thing. It has been in the, the lab for a while. It runs around on the tabletop. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's, you know, it vibrates and it does this thing. Please smash it with a hammer. Smash it with a hammer. And the other condition, another set of people, this is Frank. Frank's been in the lab for a little while and we kind of like him and he does this stuff. He's a little scatterbrained. And there's, you know, there's a backstory. Please smash him with a hammer. They smash him with a hammer. Without the backstory, it takes an average of three seconds for them to smash it with a hammer. With the backstory, it takes an average of six seconds. There's a three second hesitation. It's the exact same thing, you're doing the exact same action, but by giving agency, anima, a sense of soul, I don't know what it is, to these things, you've influenced how people think about them. You could hypothesize they feel a little bit guilty for smashing Frank, whereas smashing you know, the little vibrating doohickey, who cares? So how you frame stuff is really, really, really important. Um, the Wii Robot papers are up. If you Google for Wii Robot, you can read them. Uh, there's a few of them I'll talk about in this talk. And I think this, this is really good because it's one, one of the first experiments where we've actually been able to show this, where people have actually been able to show you can the framing stuff statistically, significant, statistically significantly influences your behavior. And so if it influences it on this simple level, I'm willing to bet that framing and talking about things in a certain way will influence legislation and how we talk about things in the legal context. But it's complicated. This is Paro. Uh, it is a robot designed to look like a seal. It, it moves a little bit, it kind of purrs. And it's designed to be used in elder care, elder care facilities to give a little bit of social contact to elderly people. Uh, we talk, it's come up today in the, in the session today. And there's evidence that this really helps. It get, increases social engagement. And it, it, um, it improves the quality of these people's lives. There's a larger context, a larger question of should they have humans, right? And, you know, I don't want to get into that question, but given that they don't have humans and they're not allowed to keep pets, they get this, and it actually helps. Now, until recently, the, what we, the, the way we thought about describing robots was in very utilitarian terms. So it's a hammer, it's a fancy hammer, right? It's a device that we use to do a job, and we shouldn't anthropomorphize it. But it becomes really complicated with things like this because to do its function, you have to ascribe stuff to it that doesn't exist. So there's an open question. So how would you legislate this? Suppose you legislate robots as hammers, as tools. Would you legislate this as a tool? Or would you legislate it closer to something that was alive? So you can, you can ask that in, in the context of a question. So is it okay for me to walk in as a technician, and take Paro here from the lady who's interacting with it, you know, excuse myself, take it, turn it on its belly, rip its belly open, pull its innards out, and fix something. Would that be? Yeah, so the robot never has emotion, but it might, there might be utility in legislating it and thinking about it and acting on it as if it did, because of the social context it finds itself in. And that becomes really complicated. Ah! Ah! ah. Oh no. Pleo didn't show up. Okay. Um, does, who knows the Pleo dinosaur toy? Awesome, right? Is Pleo alive? Oh, come on. 
come on. They're extinct. They're, they are actually extinct, right? That's true. Um, Plato is a little dinosaur toy, and it's very realistic. It's, it's super cute. If I was going to anthropomorphize any robot, it would be Plato. And I was in the Tech Museum in San Jose, um, and they had uh, an exhibit about social robots. And part of that, this was meant to be Plato. It doesn't show up on the screen. Um, this was one of the exhibits. <laughs> My kids got really freaked out. Plato's been flayed. So, Plato is a robot. It's pretty clear that it is a robot. It's a mechanism covered with a plastic skin. This caused distress to my five-year-old. Should we legislate Plato as if it were a little animal and make it illegal for kids to skin Plato's? I don't know if you've met my five-year-old. You probably haven't. He generalizes really well. So there, is a, there might be a real risk if he had a Plato and he skinned him. He said, oh. I wonder if cats are like that. And he'd go out and he'd skin a cat. Maybe it's a far-fetched argument. It's a transference argument. And you know, we make this, this debate goes back and forth in a number of contexts. But is there utility in le legislating this as if it were alive, not because it is alive, and not because we believe it's alive, but because it lowers the barrier to treating things which are alive in a way that we would treat, treat this, which is not? Right, right. Yeah, but it's... Right. Right, but I think, I think it's... I think it's slightly different in this context because the barrier to replicating this on an animal is less than the barrier to me going and plasticizing something. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not unrelated, certainly. Yeah, was it alive? Because well, you could do this on Pleo when it was alive. Struggling. <laughs> you can still leave. <laughs> um, so I, I, mean, I, I don't have any answers for this, but it, there's, there's questions here that are not clear cut, and we, we really need to think about them. Um, and that brings us to what Neil Richards and I, uh, Neil is a, a legal scholar, uh, Washington University School of Law, um, I've called in one of our papers the android fallacy. The idea that when we're talking about robots, so there's two versions of the android fallacy. The, the old version is that when we're talking about our robots, we should be very clear what they are. So I think robots are tools. They are mechanisms, at least for now. In the future, it will, you know, it's going to be a little harder to, to say. But for now, for the next 10 years, 20 years, Robots are tools. They're deterministic. Same inputs, same outputs. The world that gives them their inputs is kind of messy, and so we won't get the same inputs twice. But if we did, we'd get the same behavior. The world's an MDP. Um, it's a it, in the guts of it, it's deterministic. The computer is deterministic. That's a statement. The computer is deterministic. <laughs> Um, we can argue about that, that this later. Um, it has no free will. Any non-determinism is randomness. Okay, it has no anima, it has no free will. We must always talk about robots as if they were tools. Um, and then, based on some work that Kate did, we got sort of thinking of, well, maybe the case of Paro, maybe we shouldn't talk about that as if it's just a tool. Maybe we should talk about that as if it has some form of animacy. But when we're doing it, we should disclose that we're doing that. We should always start, I know that Paro is a machine, but I'm going to treat it as if it is this other thing, which is slightly more than a machine. And so the, the, the Android fallacy, the, the, the idea here is we shouldn't delude ourselves into talking about things that are, um, that are not representative of the world. Um, and so I was finishing my slides in the last section, session, and I'm going to pick on you. You said an excellent thing. You said, uh, we're talking about, um, Anders was talking about the, the, the long-term thing, and uh, you said, I'm pretty sure the robots will want to exist. 
So that's, ex that's exactly, that's a, this is a great illustration of that. So the robots won't want anything because the robots aren't conscious. The robots might, in their heads, have a representation that we interpret as them being, des having the, uh, desire is the wrong word. See, it's, it's hard to talk about this. Having them want to servo to a particular state, a goal, a well-defined goal, a point in n-dimensional space where they want to drive their parameters to. They don't want to drive their parameters. See how hard it is? Where they want their parameters to go to. Um, but they don't want to exist. They don't have this sort of existential angst, right? I'll, I'll jump in because you picked on me. Shh, I mean, we talk it. about magnets, you know, the North Pole magnet yeah. wants to touch the South Pole the magnet, and nobody gets confused and thinks yeah. that these magnets. Because magnets are hammers. Mag magnets are like this pointer. It's not going to do anything unless something acts on it. But one more to the other pole, right? Yeah, but that's acting on it, right? So, and you understand magnetism. A lot of this, I think, boils down to systems we understand and systems we don't understand on a personal level. If you understand the system as a mechanism, it's a, it's a hammer. If you don't, it is somehow animate. Um, what if we completely understood how a spider's brain works? Uh -huh. Is a spider animate? Um, well, it depends if you're a, you know, a, a strict materialist or not, right? Um, I am. So yeah, I mean, spiders, a spider and a robot that exactly replicates what a spider is and does, is a, they're the same thing. The same thing. Does a spider want something? The spider, if I, want is a, a convenient label to describe an, a, so want isn't, so I, I said I'm a strong materialist, so I have to say no, right? Want. That has nothing to do with materialism. What about legislate how to use the word want? Yeah, so want. Do that. Want is a, a convenient label for a You're not a lawyer. Let me finish. <laughs> Let me finish. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer because I let you interrupt me. Um, want is a convenient label for a collection of system states that correspond to a behavior that if we saw it in a human, we would say, oh, they want that. Or a dog, right? But it's not, it's not, I mean, do dogs have consciousness? Do they want stuff? Well, yeah, consciousness, they want things. <laughs> do they, are they more than machines? Different yeah. from machines. Yeah, so, so, so my, uh, one of the points is why that, you why don't you, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna lazy you with my laser pointer to get you to shut up. Um, so that's a, a beautiful example of this problem. We use this language which is overloaded and not clear cut. And I say want, and I know what I mean. Want maps to system states. You say want, and you know what you mean, but it's not what I mean. And, there's all, and everyone has a different understanding of this, and the entailments are different. And so what that means is if we use this language, if I say to someone who's going to form a law, oh, the robot wants to do this, the, you know, the dog wants to do that, they can have a model of what's going on that doesn't correspond to reality, right? If the dog has agency, if the dog wants to do something, then am I no longer completely responsible as a pet owner for its behavior? All right, so avoid that at all costs. Um, I want to just whip through some of the stuff that's come up at We Robot in the past couple of years because, not because there's any answers here, but because there's some just fantastic questions. Um, a couple of years ago, we had someone from Liquid Robotics, which is an ocean glider company, come to WeRobot. And so an ocean glider is a little submersible thing with um, essentially wings on it, tethered by a hard tether to a float on the surface. The float goes up and down with wave action, and that drags the, the glider up and down through the water column, and it propels it forward. Um, they were saying that they cannot make this part larger than a particular size. And it's really hurting them because they can't, the bigger that is, the more power, they, the, the, the faster the, the glider can go. But they're limited to a particular size. Why? Well, it's, in, it's at sea, so it's subject to the international law of the sea. If it's small enough, it's classified as debris. And if you hit it and your ship sinks, I'm not liable. 
if it's larger than a certain size, it's a vessel. I'm, all, I'm liable, but the vessel also needs a pilot. So I have to put a guy on my unmanned vehicle. Otherwise, it's illegal. And you could argue, if, this, you know, if they, they made this bigger, and they, they went out, and a ship hit it, and it went to court, you could argue that, well, we don't actually need a pilot. It's, it's unmanned. But there's legal risk there. And the company is averse enough to the risk that they're not willing to go there. It's slowing them down, because we don't have an understanding of unmanned systems in international waters. This is awesome. So if you, if you Google for sh shoot down a drone, um, you get this as the first hit. Um, there's a thing called the Game of Drones Aerial Sports League, which is, as far as I can tell, a sports league for people who like to shoot down drones with shotguns. Um, so at uh, 2014, one of the papers that we wrote about hypothesized self-defense against drones. Are you legally allowed to shoot down a drone over your property? Right? So you have you know, a couple of acres, drone comes in, you think it might be you know, videotaping you. Are you legally allowed to shoot it down? We don't know. Um, so you own your property, and you own some of the airspace above your property. And it's pretty clear that you own at least as high as this. And it's pretty clear you don't own 25,000 feet and up. But it's not actually written down anywhere where your property rights extend to, because we've never needed it. So it's not clear if the drone's on your property or not. If it crosses the boundary and you assume that it is, then you have the right to remove other people's property from your property, which you could argue you can do with a shotgun. Um, so it's like, kind of like a car that someone parks. But you, you're allowed to move that car if someone parks it on your, your, your property, but you're not allowed to intentionally damage it. Um, two months after the paper was presented, there was a guy in Texas, had to be Texas, who shot down a drone over his property. It was further complicated because Texas has a stand your ground law. If you are in fear for your life, you are allowed to open fire. What do you think? Drones are scary. We frame drones as being scary. So there's just legal open-endedness here. We don't know what analogies to apply, and we don't know how to think about these things. This is horrific. Um, so this was in Japan. I keep looking at Cape when, I've got an, when I'm looking for answers. I don't remember where it was, but it was recent. It was recent. So some, this woman was sleeping on the floor in her apartment. And her robot vacuum cleaner, her Roomba, tried to kill her by sucking her, her hair. She had long hair. Sucking her hair in Holly's. It's not a Roomba. I don't know what we Not a Roomba. Her robot vacuum cleaner. South Korea. South Korea. Thank you. Um, the Roomba-like rob robot vacuum cleaner. You're right. It's not a Roomba with its spinning things, inhaled her hair and wouldn't let go. And paramedics came, and it took them a while, like a couple of hours, I think, to get her out of the vacuum cleaner. And this must have really hurt. Um, so this is quite clear legally, I think. But it does, it, it does open the question of, if you're a robot vacuum cleaner company, do you have to worry about this? Do you have to put this on the product liability label? What other crazy things have you not envisaged, envisaged that might kill your company with a lawsuit? Um, randomly, if you are worried about the robot uprising, this is an excellent book by Dan Wilson. Um, the, the basic answer is stand on a chair and wait 20 minutes. <laughs> Robots and Daleks have pretty similar survival mechanisms. Um, all right, we're back to remote physical work. Um, jurisdiction. I'm doing work in another state. Where, so right now, I, the, the tax questions are clear. Where do I pay taxes? Well, if I do remote telepresence work in California, am I actually working in California? Where does that work exist? Our understanding of work is it exists where you and the work are, but now you're, you're not co-located. Um, there are economic arguments to this. If I have a robot in California doing high-value work, and I live in Rhode Island, 
I don't have a house in California. It affects the tax base in California. It affects the economics there. Um, there's a, a tremendous amount of interesting questions there. Um, can you get around the H-1B visa problem by not bringing people to the country, but just having them come in with their robots from abroad? Um, oh, man. This was the most awesome picture of the talk, and it's not showing. This, um, this picture. <laughs> so you're worried about the robot uprising and the robots are going to take over. I can't even do PowerPoint. I'm, I'm a roboticist. Um, this was the evil law enforcement robot from Robocop, which looks really scary. Um, there was a paper at WeRobot about automating law enforcement. And so the idea that you can take the existing body of laws and you can more efficiently enforce them by having robots, whether physical robots or software robots, enforce those laws for you. So every time you go through a red light, it automatically sees you're going through, gets your license plate, sends you a ticket, the whole thing. Um, and so there's a couple of issues around this. One, it's really hard to automate the law because the law is full of things like probable cause and reasonable speed and prudence. So you can't implement those as computer code because you've got to assign numbers to them. Um, an eye-opener for me, too, is that laws, laws like speeding laws, are not actually written to be enforced. If we enforced every traffic violation that is committed in this country, the legal system would collapse. Okay? There, there's, a, there's, a wiggle, there's a wiggle room. And so you could build that into your code, but you would have to specify it as a, as a number plus or minus three, and then you've, that's no longer wiggly, that's an actual number, it's three more than the speed limit. Um, and there was, this is, a, this is a, a, an especially great paper because um, two of the authors are legal experts, and one of the author is an electrical engineer. And what they did was they formulated uh, this way of thinking about the problem as one of entropy. And what they said is you could automate law enforcement as long as it retains the entropy of the original process. So sometimes you speed and you don't get caught some percentage of the time. And they figured that you could get away with automating the process such that the same percentage of the time, the system would know you're guilty but let you get away with it. So that's our, if you read one paper from We Robot last year, this is the one to read, I think. Especially if you're interested in the interplay of technology and law. Um, one more. You, you probably heard about this. There was uh, an art project in Switzerland, I think, where an artist programmed her computer, gave her computer some Bitcoin, and programmed it to buy random stuff from the web and send it to her. <coughs> and this is a collection of the random stuff that it bought. Uh, whoops, 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 whoops. That's a fake Hungarian passport. I think either, th either this or this is uh, a considerable collection of ecstasy pills. So things which are illegal to buy, which you can get on the web, has a crime being committed. Crime requires intent, right? Maybe there's a crime of negligence she didn't think it could have. Well, I don't know. Did it buy it from Switzerland? What's the jurisdiction? Um, these questions are open. So this is, the, you know, the, 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 the code didn't have animacy, didn't have agency, but it was making decisions that weren't supervised, that you couldn't foresee. So it's getting towards agency. Um, where does the responsibility lie? All right, almost done. So how do we address these problems? Um, this is an awesome actual comic, um, Magnus the Robot Fighter who fights robots with his bare fists. I have nothing to say about it other than it's an awesome comic. Um, in the year 4000, apparently. So I'm really heartened that we're talking about this stuff now. Because if we talk about this stuff after it happens, we'll get it wrong. It will be too late. Um, it's great to see economists and policy scholars and legal scholars and roboticists all in the same space. Um, we really need to, to 
talk to each other about this and learn to see from each other's perspectives. We need to learn from recent law, so cyber law, the law that surrounds the internet. And we can learn a lot from there. It doesn't carry across completely, but we can learn a lot, so we should really be informed by that as we make this next set of laws. Um, Ryan Kahlo from University of Washington has proposed that not, not, there's no government structure that covers robotics properly. So the FTC doesn't cover it really, and none of the, the existing commissions do. So he proposed a Federal Robotics Commission. Maybe we should start talking about that. Maybe the right thing to do is not to form analogies with prior stuff. Maybe it's just to build something out of whole cloth. Um, talking to stakeholders, talk to people who actually care. Um, Peter's work with, the, with uh, ICRAC is fantastic, because you talk, talking to policymakers and people in the military about arms control, and not just doing it in an academic setting, actually going and talking to them on the ground and figuring out what the needs are and figuring out what happens when the rubber hits the road. Um, avoid the Android fallacy, because it leads to confusing, <laughs> um, confusing discussions that I have no good answers for. Um, be really clear about what your robots are doing, especially when you talk to people. Because if you, if you use words that are overloaded, if you hint that there's animacy there, there's a real risk of getting it wrong. Um, join, get your Congress people to join the Congressional Robotics Caucus. Get them to be informed about what's going on. I am pleased to see Rhode Island is represented. Um, as of last week, so is Oregon. Um, but these people and their staffers, if they are better informed about what, what robots can do, what the actual threats are, what the actual abilities are, they will form better laws. Okay, that's a tangible step that we can do to make things better. Bring them to your labs, if you have labs, if you're roboticists. Bring them in, show them stuff. Don't be hyperbolic about it. You know, show them it, doing it for real. Um, that really helps. And, if you're a policy guy, talk to roboticists. Um, Ela, I am really sorry, but I, last night I, I typed roboticist into Google, and you're one of the top hits. I just wanted a picture of a roboticist. Um, so talk. Hmm? <laughs> oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> um, if you're not a technologist, talk to technologists. Figure out what robots can do. Figure out what the actual technology is capable of. Because um, there's a lot of hyperbola out there, um, especially when we start to, talk, start to talk further into the future about the singularity. And without getting into the singularity or not argument, we are going to get more and more sophisticated systems that do look more and more intelligent. But there's a rate, and Anders had this great insight that maybe what we should be doing is doing an analysis of that and figuring out what that rate of change is. Can we say we've got 20 years before it becomes dangerously intelligent? And just formally looking at how fast AI is, is growing, I think is a, a fantastic idea. Um, come to our conference, We Robot. It's in Miami. Um, this is this year's program committee. We'll probably have a large overlap with next year's program committee. This is policy scholars, legal scholars, roboticists, hopefully economists, coming in, talking about issues like this, and trying to figure it out, trying to, try, trying to get a jump on this. Um, and so I want to thank my collaborator at uh, WashU, Neil Richards. Uh, Neil's a legal scholar, and everything I know about the law, I kind of know from Neil. Um, and all, all the mistakes are my own, but he's been he, he, he's just a great, great guy who gets the technology and understands how it applies. Um, the crowd at We Robot, there's about 200 people attend it now, are fantastic. And a lot of the ideas that came, from, came into this talk came from We Robot, from discussions there and from people there, and people I've just shamelessly ripped off in the talk. Um, this is my shameless self-promotion. I come from Oregon State University. We have a robotics program. If you want a, a master's or a PhD in robotics, which takes into consideration these larger social issues. This is our lab space. Is this better than this guy? <laughs> that's, what it, that's what it will look like. <laughs> yeah, we actually dangle these things. We dangle these things from the roof on strings. Um, it looks more or less like that. It will look more like it when we paint it. But 18,000 square feet modeled after CMU's space to some extent. Uh, but we, we have a robotics program. We have 10 roboticists full time. Um, on the faculty there.
And with that, I'll shut up and take questions. This is just for fun, but back to the robotic committee. Mm -hmm. You want to find out which robot did it because we don't elect Republican congressmen. <laughs> <laughs> it's an R after his name. Landry is a right? <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> so you can direct it. Very good. Maybe it's a robot called the robot. The robot. That's the R for robot. <laughs> so language uh, is owned by the language community. Yes. And language can change. Absolutely. But it's not that you have a totally different way of using a word than I do, than <coughs> Charlene does, than Michael does. Mm -hmm. It's constrained by use and by function, by criteria. Yeah. And there might be a gray area where we don't anymore know whether we should use the word want for smaller and smaller and more primitive animals. Mm -hmm. But would you agree that we build robots that have some of the functional properties that we normally use to assess that that's probably a creature that it wants, and those may be different functional properties from it thinks, and it's not entirely clear whether one comes before the other in sort of complexity. Yeah, it's, it's then, what? then it would be perfectly fine to talk about robots that way, and there might be already some robots for which it would be fine. Yeah, I think that's I think that's entirely appropriate. I think the the gist of what we're trying to propose is not that we don't use the word want or we don't use the thing, but we're very upfront about what we mean by it. So when I say want in the context of my Roomba, it means a very different thing than when I say want in, the, in your context. Right? The, the entailment is not that. So when I talk about a human, a human wants something. There's an entailment that involves that, you know, a whole backstory for that human, right? There's a, there's a lot of processing going on there. So I don't know, you know, you might, it's, it, it is in part, but it's, um, it's, more, it's more complex behavior. And so, when, you know, you want, um, I don't know what you want, you want a cup of coffee, right? Right, and so there's entailment there, like, why does she want coffee? Does she like, co she must like coffee. I wonder why she likes computer scientist. And there's a whole set of stuff that's associated with that word want, right? And you don't consciously process that, I think, but it does, um, it does inform your thinking. When I say want in, the ter in terms of my little simple robot, it's, there's much less entailment. What I mean is some sensor threshold exceeded some number, and then the motor turned on. It's predictive, yeah. And I think, I think using, using words like that is appropriate and the right thing to do when you're clear about what it entails. So it's a, you know, it's a shorthand. Like a lot of language is a shorthand for describing a bunch of mental states. Um, I think it, it becomes, it, it just, I think it just becomes muddier when you get into sort of higher cognitive functions. When you say the robot, um, oh, the robot likes you, right? It, it, it invites you to ascribe stuff to the robot that it doesn't have. Well, people actually, we have some data, and other people have some data showing that people have a, a pretty clear gradient of what kind of mental states they're easily willing and, and almost sort of uh, unconsciously attribute to robots. And right. cognitive states, no problem. Some of the motivational states, no problem. Mm -hmm. Wants, no problem. Intent becomes a little more yeah. difficult. Yeah. So maybe, maybe, works again. Maybe wants a bad example. Emotions, uh, pretty low likelihood. Mm -hmm. uh, people just don't think that there are emotions in there. So they are actually normally also less likely, if they have you know, some reflection, right. less likely to use that. Yeah. So I think that would be a natural way of just thinking of language as it is now relative to robots as they are now. But all of that can change. Even without consciousness, even without free will, because in none of these entailments is consciousness of free will. I mean, three or four year old no, kids no, use the word no. believe without having, having any conceptions of free will or consciousness. We well, the no, no concept, no, no, no articulatable concept of it. So let me get, let me tell you a story from We Robot. I was talking to a lawyer the first year of We Robot. We were talking about landmines. Landmines are autonomous robots as a sensor, which a thing you stand on, it has a decision process, which is just an electrical circuit. If the sensor is closed, it's on. If it's open, it's not. 
and it has an actuator, which is explosive. Right? And so you can build a landmine with a switch, a wire, a battery, and some explosive. And we have legislation around landmines. And so everyone in this room could build that device, more or less, I would think. Right? Because it's a mechanical thing, a switch closes. And so I was talking to uh, a, a legal scholar, and then I, said, I said, so what if you took that device and you replaced the mechanical switch with a microcontroller, a little computer chip, that did the same thing? And his lang when he talked about the one with the microchip in it, his language changed. The landmine with a physical mechanical switch was a device. But the landmine with the, met, with the electronic switch um, decided when to blow up. There was agency in this one that wasn't in this one, despite the fact that they were functionally equivalent. And I saw, poked at him what the difference was, and he couldn't really articulate it. But this one was more intelligent than this one. And I think what the difference is, in that case at least, is stuff you can explain and stuff you can build and stuff you can't. So I think for anyone who's got an electrical background, like an electrical engineering background, those are the same system. Well, well you know, all right, there's a couple of NAND gates in there or something. It's like some simple electronic mechanism. Um, but they, they're functionally the same thing. You should probably think about them in the same way, broadly speaking. But if you don't know how it works, there's some special sauce in there. And I think... Yeah, you don't really know. It could work. It could. Yeah, yeah. So maybe it's predictive, right? So maybe it's predictive. That's, yeah. that's, the, that's the difference. Um, but I think there's, we run the risk of that sort of misinterpretation, I think, unless we pin it down. Unless we, I think having a, a common vocabulary would be a great thing if we can sort of define the terms of that vocabulary, like define the, the scope of it. Uh, I mean. So uh, there seem to be lots of changes needed for the laws to be compatible with the technology. And apparently because probably the laws were written way <coughs> then the technology did not exist at the time. So my question is that do you think we are at the moment that probably we have to just put the probably laws aside and write them from scratch? from the experience that we gained from the laws before, or we have to modify them little by little. And if we really get to the point that we be a dead end and we cannot pursue any more from that point. I think it has to be the second one. We can't design stuff from scratch anymore. Um, just from a practical standpoint, um, you know, getting such a thing through Congress would be impossible. Like, you know, implementing such a thing would be impossible. Um, I think, I mean, maybe, I'll think about the tax code. The tax code is a, a set of laws which I think should be scrapped and started again. But that's never going to happen. Because it, I believe oh, five bucks says that's never going to happen. Um, because although it's rational, as engineers, right, we're, we like to be rational, it's just there's a larger context that's, that's going to stop that. Um, so I think we have to work with what we've got, and we have to educate people to make the right tweaks to make it work. Um, having said that, you know, I, I think Ryan's idea of a, a federal robotics commission, which is a, a new thing, would be an interesting way to do it. So not completely replacing stuff, but making a new entity, and then you could build stuff from whole cloth in there. So isn't it possible that we are probably in the wrong direction now, and we are modifying it, and down the road we are getting to the dead end. And if we now change our direction, we'll probably put ourselves in a better direction so we would not get to a disaster down the road. Yeah, I, I, I think it's entirely possible, yeah. But, you know, we're, we're kind of on a, a thing with a lot of momentum. And, you know, maybe we see the, we see the cliff coming, but it's, it's hard to divert. Um, I, don't know, I don't know that it, it will. That will happen. Um, there's certainly the risk that will that, that'll happen, but uh, I don't know. Anders. Um, so thinking about the other analogies, one that hasn't been mentioned here is animals. 
which are interesting because they're not rational. Right. They might have, to some degree, intentionality, although the law recognizes that, yeah, it's not the human kind of moral agent intentionality, but certainly a dog can sometimes get a stupid idea. Uh, it, it, however, it seems that uh, we have a problem that the, the law has not been updated for animals very much. Uh, back in the day where the horses were mm -hmm. much more common, there was actually quite a lot of laws about horses and dogs. And then we've kind of been ignoring the animals, so they might actually be not a very salient analogy right now. Right. It might actually be even problematic to use that as an analogy. Although one might say, or argue that the owner of a robot has the same relationship to as an owner of a dog. Yeah, right. if it's a no, I, dog, I, I, uh, you're actually fairly liable. Yeah, I think that's an, that would be, if you, if you had to pick a starting point, I think that would be an excellent starting point. Because the, the relationship between you and your um, partially autonomous robot is kind of like the relationship between you and your dog. You're responsible at some level, and then at some level, maybe you're not. I, I actually don't know, the, don't know the laws surrounding dogs very well. But you know, it, it, is, it is not directly in your control, but you can guide it. So I think you know, that looking to that might be the, a really good way to get started. There are no automated vehicles. There are self-driving cars, which is a framing thing. Um, are they getting it right? I don't know. Um, um, I think I, th I think it's kind of premature to tell if we're getting it right or not, because um, we're we're kind of making it up as we go. Google had the project, and then some laws came in to say, okay, that's legal, probably, and then. It's, it's not clear what the, the rule, I, I, let me say, I don't know what the rules are with safety drivers in those cars. You know, Google has someone right there all the time, two someones right there all the time. Um, so I don't, I don't know, um, and I think there, there's a, a really critical point when the, we'll know if we're getting it right when the Google car kills someone for the first time, and if the project gets canceled or not, I think. Because um, it, eventually it'll hit someone and eventually someone will die. And the way we think about that, whether we frame it in a larger, it'll be safer overall, or oh, this, the, the robot killed someone, we have to stop the project. I think that, that'll be informative. Yeah, so can you give me an idea as clearly as I think that one very important. Um, but if we're talking to the general public, people who are not experts in the area, there seems to be a hard barrier there to communicate those ideas. Like, do I have to describe how an MVP works to talk about the decision process that's, that's running into a person, or should I use words that are maybe more familiar with? Right, and that, I mean, that, that's the thing, right? That's why we use this, this overloaded language so much, is because people don't know what MVPs are, and we talk about intent, and we talk about volition. Um, I think part of it, you know, if we, if kids in schools were trained to understand algorithms, that would be better. But then we're starting to talk about this large systemic change, which won't happen. Um, I think it, it, there is a balance there, right? So you want to talk about these systems in an accessible way so people understand sort of folk psychology of robots. But at the same time, you've got to be really careful about ascribing stuff to them. So I, I've got no answers, but yes, that's a, that's a definite problem. And, and going the other way is, is, is even, it's just as bad. So giving it intent is bad, but coming in and you telling me it's an MDP and it optimizes the value function in there, and me getting nothing from that makes it magic. And so that's just as bad on the other side too. So there, the, hopefully there's a middle ground. Um, and I think when we're talking about legislation, the, we, can, we can foster that by trying to make sure there are people in the legal community who will end up as staffers for Congress people who understand the technology and can do partial translations. And so we can filter up to the people who actually make policy. Matthias. So you mentioned the uh, landmine as being a robot, and I understand the definition of that's true. Uh, there are lots of other kinds of definitions, and I'm just curious if at the We Robot Conference people are talking about how, la how laws would be, have to 
you know, have to be formulated so that they actually take into account the diversity of devices that fall under the category of robot? I don't think so. I think the the definition of a robot at We Robot is overly broad. It includes trading agents, it includes software agents. I think it includes anything with intelligence, any process with intelligence. Didn't someone Did you have a prosthesis? Yeah, but yeah, I heard he was really busy and didn't <laughs> process those numbers yet. Um, <clears throat> if I'm going to give a talk, a couple of, hmm? Isn't that the laptop we just heard about all the time? Just run a couple of, um, the, I've, I've been sort of railing at the, at the community a little bit to try and narrow the scope uh, to a robot is a thing with a physical body and inputs and outputs and apparently intelligent action. So, you know, the, the sort of traditional AI, embodied AI version of robotics. But the, I think the community there really wants to have a, a broader picture of it. So, you know, high frequency trading has been a, a thing that's come up a lot, which I don't consider to be a robotic thing. It's, a, it's purely software. Um, but there's, you know, it's a, it's a more colloquial use of robot there. But I think if we're going to write reg legislation for robots, it's the same clarity thing. We have to define what we mean by robot. Because to me, the landmine is a robot. Maybe to you, it isn't. And so unless we have that common understanding, then it's going to be unclear whether the legislation covers this thing or doesn't cover this. Uh, so uh, let's thank our speaker again.